their life is not like like animals so have life glory to god hallelujah and also humans have life and uh, in fact the, when we read the bible we get to one of the things i normally think about is there are actually no such things as non-living things <laughs> glory to god uh, in school we used to learn about living things and non-living things but uh, according to the bible <laughs> The Bible says, in him were all things made, both present and future, and, uh, and so on, both things to come and things that are, all things were made by him and through him and for him. Hallelujah. And in him all things do what? Consist. So that means, uh, all things means all things. Hallelujah. Even stones which we are told are non-living things. You see, Jesus said, God is the God of the living, not the, not the dead. You remember that? Uh, so, that's why Jesus could afford to say that if you stop these that are trying to praise me, the stones will cry out, hallelujah, because they are not non-living things. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? So, there are no such things as non-living things because if there were, those things wouldn't be created by God. And yet all things have been what? Have been created by him. Not only have they been created by him, they are sustained by him because the Bible says he upholds all things by the what? By the word of his power. So, the, where we can begin is to first of all talk about what you are like what's your nature because the nature of the thing gives us an indication of the kind of life it has if we are to talk about the meaning of life we must first of all understand you what you are and then what you are will will give us a direction to go hallelujah lest we find ourselves talking about plant life <laughs> glory to god so the, the just as there's plant life animal life and like i've said even life of so-called non-living things there is also life of us humans hallelujah and um, and so when we ask what's the meaning of life according to the bible or what the bible has to say about life like i've said it begins by us querying what's the nature of man hallelujah because what man is will tell us what what life is hallelujah glory to god so uh when we talk about man um and it's good i started there on talking about living things and non-living things you find that in the bible um god who made these things that are not human life and that are not to be put on the same level as human life still wanted those things to have should we call them parallels or analogies or um, life lessons for us, the humans? Hallelujah. So that's why you find in the Bible, for example, in Job 14, verse 7, the Bible is talking to humans and it is telling them there is hope for a tree that though it is cut down. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's talking to humans about human life and yet he's talking to them about human life through the life lesson of plant life isn't that so so it says there is hope for a tree that though it's what at least there is hope can you give me king james hallelujah glory to god do you have it <laughs> at least all right for there is hope for a, there is hope of a tree if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. What's the next verse? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, while it comes, I'm just trying to at least help you to see that this tree he's talking about is you, the human. And he's saying there's hope for you, but the way he wants you to understand it is the way you understand the trees. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stalk thereof die in the ground, 
Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead. Yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth boughs like a plant. But man dies and wastes away, yea, man gives up the ghost. <laughs> and where is he? Hallelujah. So, I just wanted to show you, God is certainly not saying that um, he's, not tr he's not thinking the way the animalists are thinking, the naturalists are thinking, uh, the universalists are thinking. He's not thinking of reincarnation and you dying and coming back like a fly or a plant, but certainly him as the creator of these things did not do anything without a purpose. Actually, the, if we were to say what is the purpose is that everything he created was for his primary occupants who are the humans. Hallelujah. The humans were the ones he had in mind when he brought cows here, when he brought trees here. Um, so, we, we must not go to the extreme either side uh, to, to become <laughs> too much in love with the planet that the planet is Mother Nature and it is God. Hallelujah. Yet at the same time, we must not uh, disavow the planet so much that there is nothing in the planet that has what? That um, is, is to be drawn from. Hallelujah as a lesson from God. That, that is God speaking to us. Paul talks about that quite a bit. But I wanted to read for you another verse. Now, hey, this one is even more vivid. First Peter chapter 1, verse 24 tells us that all men are as grass and all the glory of man. Hallelujah. First Peter 1, 24 says, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass, the grass withers or withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word uh, which by the gospel is preached unto you. Hallelujah. Again, there you are seeing plant life being used as, as, um, as a picture of human life. Glory to God. Not to say that plant life is equivalent to human life. No. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But certainly to say that plant life is a picture of human life. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. It is a picture of human life, but it's not an equivalent of human life. I hope that that makes sense. Glory to God. Now, Isaiah 65, 22 even is more vivid. It says, for as the days of a tree, so are the days of my people. In fact, it first says, they shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another eat, for as the days of a what? As the days of, the, of a tree are the days of my what? Of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of, your hand, of their hands. I think you even remember one time when Jesus, Jesus laid hands, uh, he, he spat on the ground, made mud out of, of, the, of the soil, put it on a blind man's eyes. Um, then, no, this was another incident, I think. Anyway, in one of these incidences, he lays hands on the man, uh, tells him to, to, uh, to ask him, what do you see? And the man says, I see men like what? I see men like what? I see men like trees walking. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then Jesus lays hands on him again. And what happens? And he saw every man clearly. But this, the thing of trees was still also valid in a, in a symbolic sense. Praise the Lord. In the Bible, that has happened a lot where God typifies humans as, as plants. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And then there's Psalm 1, verse 1, which says, uh, Blessed is a man that walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on it he does meditate day and night. He shall be like a what? A tree that's planted by the streams of water. 
whose leaf does not do what? Does not wither, and then it says it does not cast its fruit, brings forth its fruit in its season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall what? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We are actually talking about the meaning of life, and we are starting it from where God wants us to start. There is nothing here that uh, God has created for ornaments or decoration. It's, it does that as well, but that's, there's a higher purpose than that. Praise the Lord. That's why he's able to say, go to the ant, you sluggard, and look at the ant and see that the ant, having no master, prepares his food in winter, in what? In summer, for the winter. Glory to God. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Hallelujah. So there you are being shown human life from animal life. Glory to God. Come on, encourage me. Am I, am I going somewhere or I'm just, I'm, I'm just, you know, digging crosswise. Hallelujah. So, Psalm 92 verse 10. Psalm 92 verse 10, I, <laughs> I believe it says, My horn you have exalted like the horn of a, of a strong wild bull or a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. They that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall flourish like the palm tree. They shall grow up like a cedar in what? In Lebanon. Glory to God. Again, here is a unicorn. A unicorn is a, is a bull. That's animal life. And you're being told that you're going to flourish like a tree. You're going to be strong, anointed, and victorious like a bull. You know, when you see a bull, uh, how many of you have seen those Mexican, those Mexican shows where they, this guy is holding a red, a red what? A red cloth, and you know, he does this, and the bull passes, then he does this, and the thing passes, and you're like, wow. But man, it's no joke. Hallelujah. Because when the bull comes, it announces its victory from ahead of time. So you better find your level. Glory to God. And that's what he's saying that I've been anointed, and thus my horn is exalted like a strong bull. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And then you'll find when, when, uh, when Jacob was, was praying for, was blessing his children before he died, he used again these same kind of analogies. In uh, I, Genesis chapter 49, if you want to write this down, you can write it down. 49 verse 9, verse 14, verse 17, verse 21, verse 22. <laughs> I'll say that again, Genesis 49, verse 9, 14, 17, 21, and 22. Hallelujah. As, as Jacob is blessing his children, he calls, <laughs> he says, Joseph's glory shall be like the fastling of, of a bullock. That's a, a bull. Eh? Then he says, God will dwell like a lion. Dan is like a lion's whelp. I think this is the young of a lion or a cub. He says Judah is also a lion's whelp that goes up from the prey and is also a, an old lion that should not be roused. Hallelujah. Then he says Issachar is a strong donkey. Hallelujah. All these analogies, verse 9, Judah is a lion's whelp. There is verse 14. There is verse 17. You could give us 14. Issachar is a strong what? Uh, that is donkey. Hallelujah. <laughs> For any of you that are not sure. <laughs> All right. By the way, that, that word came from a literal donkey. Hallelujah. So you see the Bible says to the pure, all things are what? All things are pure. You know, when we are young, as told, my wife sometimes tells me stories and I laugh. And when they were young in school, when someone was ab abusing you, they would tell you, see Hallelujah. Someone would say, see Bangladesh rectangle thermometer square. 
Hallelujah. Imagine that is abusing you. Sile Bangladesh rectangle square thermometer. And someone goes away feeling like they've abused me. They've, you see? So anyway, to the pure, all things are what? Verse 17. Dan shall be a what? A serpent by the way, an adder in the path that bites the horse heels so that his rider shall fall backward. By that, this is not serpent in a negative sense. Hallelujah. Actually, when you see the conclusion in verse 18, the father rejoices over that because he says, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. The salvation is coming through this what? This serpent that is going to bite the, the horse so that the rider can fall back. Jesus said, be wise as what? As serpents and harmless as what? Again, animal life, human life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I, I hope we are getting somewhere. So, I want to now move uh, now more specific to human life. Glory to God. I've given you a bit of an analogy that God wants us to see ourselves through, understand what life is like. Glory to Jesus. Um, already we have some pictures. We are supposed to be like palm trees, like cedars of Lebanon. Uh, we are supposed to be like trees planted by the water streams. Hallelujah. We are supposed to be like the evergreen tree that never casts its leaf, that bears fruit all year round. Hallelujah. All that is pointing us in the direction of life. Hallelujah. The meaning of life. So, now if we take it further to look at uh, human life more specifically, and, and as I'm saying all this, I have not forgotten that your theme is what? Christ our what? <laughs> Uh, Christ, our life. I, I have not forgotten that. But I do need to, to remind you that Jesus Christ, oh, let me say Jesus Christ, did not become Jesus Christ at the cross or even in Bethlehem. Hallelujah. He was always there. He is called the Word of God. In John chapter 1, verse 1, where the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And this is the word who was in the beginning with God when he created all things, namely the living things <laughs> and the so-called non-living things. Him, the word of God, was the creator of these things and then turns out to be the one upon whom all these things are held together. Him in whom all things consist. All things are not spiritual. Oh, hallelujah. They are, they are physical things, spiritual things, things seen, things not seen, things present, things past. Hallelujah. All these things were made by him, Jesus Christ. So when we talk about Christ, our life, I want you to not be so narrow in your mind to think that it is only talking about just get saved and sing hallelujah, <laughs> and that is the life, hallelujah. No, 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 no. When he was in the beginning creating the garden of Eden, he was saying something about life. Hallelujah. Him who was with the father, when, they, when the father said, let us make man, let us make two lights in the sky, let us make the plants, let us make creeping things, you understand? The word of God, him, Jesus, who is the word of God in John 1.1, 1, 1, he's the one who are told that, that he was in the beginning with God. And without him was not anything made that was made. Hallelujah. So I want you to understand, when we're talking about Christ, our life, and drawing from that a, a, a context to understand the meaning of life, there is quite a landscape for us there in Genesis. Hallelujah. Let's not be so tied. Um, and when I say that, I am not in any way diminishing what Jesus has done on the cross. I'm trying to tell you the word of God is one story from the beginning to the what? To the end. It begins in a garden. It's still going to end in a garden. Did you know that? And in the garden, there were trees. In fact, now I'm getting ahead of myself. In fact, when man is created, it's amazing that he's told that for his life, 
he must look to the tree of life. Are you seeing that? We are back to plant life. <laughs> Glory to God. And then, when he eats of the wrong tree, he dies. When he eats of the right tree, he does what? He lives. And then in the book of Revelation, the same, we are back full circle to the garden because we still have the river of life, we still have the tree of life whose leaves are for the healing of the what? Of the nation. Now, don't tell me all of that is just extravagance of God just to give us some side issues when the main thing is the cross. No, we are not saved for salvation as the end point. Salvation is not, um, is, not the, is not the story. You understand? We are being saved for the real story, which is life. Glory to God. And in this life, there is all kinds of, of um, spheres and, and uh, phases and aspects they're inclusive of some of the things I'm going to tell you. Glory to God. So don't be impatient because I, I know with the way preaching is done these days, people are just looking for certain keywords. Hallelujah. If you don't mention this keyword, that keyword, the other preacher, the other verse, uh, they are ready to, to do it, to write you off. Hallelujah. But just stay with me. You're going to get something. So in First Thessalonians, so we've moved from the analogies God uses for life, uh, namely plant life, human life, from which we get botany, zoology, <laughs> uh, what, what these things we learned in school. In fact, biology is just the study of life. And then botany is a study in the plant kingdom. Then zoology, the, the animal kingdom, hallelujah. And then anyway, like I've said, all those things are a picture of the super of the ultimate life he was trying to create, the human who is made in his image. Glory to God. So it's, it's, I would, I'm not again surprised that him in whose image we are made is also a tree. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Have you read in Romans where the Bible says uh, that you Gentiles don't boast and say other branches were, were cut off? so that I might be grafted in. Hallelujah. You remember that? Then it says, because the same one who cut off these branches because of their unbelief, how much more if these people he cut off repent because they are the original tree, will they be grafted back in? And then you who is a foreigner, you are what? Extricated from the tree. Hallelujah. So, wow, the tree thing is really all over. Glory to God. Him, Jesus Christ, even was crucified on a tree. <laughs> Glory to God. And he said, cast be any man that hangs on the tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. But this blessing that's coming on us, just as it is cast for a man to hang on a tree in that, say, in that way, it is also a blessing because we have the tree of life who is Jesus himself, into whom we are being grafted as branches. And then Jesus says, I am the vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he removes. But every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may do what? That it may bear more fruit. Wow! It looks like this, this plant life, animal life thing is quite a bit. Hallelujah! Uh, so get used to it. Because let me tell you, there's a principle I tell people all the time that God works uh, by what I call neighboring realities, or let's call them neighboring truths. Praise the Lord. That, that he can't talk about a tree of life which is spiritual when it has totally nothing to do with the natural trees we know. There is some relationship between the figures of speech and the, and the actual things. Glory to God. That's why he's able to say, there is hope for a tree that though it is cut down, yet it shall do what? Shall live again. There is hope for a tree, and that, that tree is to ultimately find the tree of life. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, I, I keep telling people, don't be too narrow in your interpretation. God is a poet. Hallelujah. 
The same way that he talks in logic, he also talks in music. Glory to God. He's that way. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I see you people looking at me like your trees. But we are getting somewhere. Hallelujah. So in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, now we are narrowing down to the human life, the most specific references to human life. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, the Bible says, uh, and uh, I pray to God that your whole spirit and soul and body may be preserved uh, blameless unto the coming of the Lord. Now, this is where we have gotten uh, the, the, classic under, the classic definition and understanding that is in the body of Christ, that man is a spirit, he has a soul, and he lives in a body. Oh, that man is spirit, soul, and what? And body. And, and like I've said to people, every time a truth comes, or we have a truth, never take it for granted that you really understand what it is saying. Hallelujah. Because we can always learn. We can always be better than what we are. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So, in the beginning, even just that notion that we are spirit, soul, and body was revolutionary. And then, uh, some, some more understanding and study having been done by scholars and teachers and so on, brought us to the understanding that actually, man is not three things. He's not a... He's not part spirit, part soul, part, part what? <laughs> Body. He's actually a spirit. He has a soul and he lives in a what? In a body. And, and that was wonderful. Uh, it, it was a wonderful. And, and one of the thoughts people are getting that from is from the fact that we are made in the image of God. Isn't it? And God is a spirit according to John 4, 24. If God is a spirit and we're made in his image and likeness, then we must be spirits. Hallelujah. Revolutionary. But now, guess what? With uh, some more plodding around in these areas, some people were led to the thinking that therefore the body is useless. Because after all, when you die, you leave the body here, isn't it? <laughs> naked, you came into this world, <laughs> and naked shall you live. You brought nothing into this world, and so you shall, in the same way, you shall return. Dust to dust, ashes to what? Ashes. But something doesn't jive with that reasoning. Because at the last day when Jesus returns, the Bible says that where the carcass is, all the eagles shall be gathered there. And it's referring to how the angels, the reapers, are going to come <laughs> to collect the what? Okay, there's two analogies in one. On one hand, the, the harvesters, who are the angels, like Jesus said in the parable of the, of the wheat and the tares, they are coming to collect the what? The body of Christ. Where the carcass is, the body, there the eagles shall be gathered. But in, in another sense, actually the, the body is Jesus, <laughs> and the eagles are all these humans that have been waiting for his coming, they're all going to be gathered where the body is. Praise the Lord. Because the Bible says that uh, when he comes, every eye shall see him. And then it says, and we shall all be gathered to him in the air to meet the Lord. Glory to God. So now here is one of the things Revelation says, book of Revelation says, that, the, that when that time comes, all the dead who are in the sea, who are in the graves, who are wherever, shall rise. But the dead are not in the sea. <laughs> you understand? The dead are not in graves like the Jehovah's Witnesses tell us, like in soil. Eh? Like for them, they, they say that when you die, you don't go to heaven. You go into the grave. And the grave is this soil. But the word grave in, in, the, in the Bible is the word meaning the pit. Hallelujah. The pit is not that, that grave that you, where you dig six feet. Hallelujah. He's talking about the pit where the rich man went and Lazarus. Hallelujah. Lazarus was in, a, uh, was in Abraham's bosom side of the pit. And then there was the side. There was a great gulf between them. There was a side where there were sufferers. Hallelujah. Then there was a side where there were people in rest. 
and pleasure. Hallelujah. Now, and then he says, Father Abraham, tell Lazarus to go and, and warn my brothers so that they don't come to this, this place where I'm being tormented in a flame or in flames. Glory to God. So, the, the, and the Bible tells us when the rich man died, he went to hell. <laughs> or he went to, the, the word hell means the, the place of departed spirits. So, when you die, it's true the body stays here and you go. But according to the Bible, you are actually, now I'm bringing us to the next evolution of this thought. We are actually not spirit having a soul living in a body. We are spirit, soul, and body. You understand? In other words, when you don't have your body, you become disembodied spirits. Spirits that have a date that something from me is missing. Hallelujah. It, you, you are like how demons are. You see, these demons... This is my theory. These demons, the word translated demon, they are, they are different kinds of evil spirits. They are fallen angels, and then there are demons. Demons, at some point or another, had a connection to a human or an animal. Namely, like when the sons of God came and, and did what? And, and uh, married we humans, and then gave birth to the these other creatures, uh, the, they call them giants. And it's not that all giants were that, but I mean those particular ones. Now, when those people died, <laughs> those people, when they died, and then now they are also, you see also all these perversions, sexual perversions that have happened, they're actually people who have sex with animals. There are people who have, and some of them produce things. You see, just as a donkey, can mate with a horse and they produce another creature, a human being can mate with an animal and produce some freak of nature. Now, this freak of nature, when it dies, those spirits become disembodied spirits and hence the demons. Are you getting what I'm saying? You, you get what I'm saying? So, they are, they, and there are different kinds of demons. There are those that are coming from humans and animals. There are those that are coming from these spirits that mute, mated with what? Humans. Even today, you've heard of these Nigerian stories of Obanjis, spiritual husbands, spiritual wives, and blah, blah, blah. And then someone gives birth to a snake or something like that. Now, some of, some, not every story we hear is true, but there are also true ones. Hallelujah. You've forgotten animal life and plant life? <laughs> I'm telling you. So anyway, so we have different kinds of spirits. That's why some people that, anyway, let me not take you too far in that direction. I just wanted you to note, to note that the reason those spirits are looking for bodies to be their hosts is because they are disembodied. You understand? It's like you moving around without clothes. You feel something is what? <laughs> and the Bible says we inwardly groan, 2 Corinthians 5, not that we may be unclothed, but further clothed upon with our heavenly heart. Uh, have you read that, 2 Corinthians 5? That's what it says. So, our bodies are our clothes, but they are not quite like the way you think of clothes that you put off your shirt and put it there, and then you go and look for another shirt. <laughs> Hallelujah. It seems like the body is like those clothes you just must have on you, like your skin. Glory to God. And that's why there's a groaning in creation, seeking not to be unclothed, but father clothed upon with that which is from above. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm talking about life, <laughs> the meaning of life. So, guess what is happening? On the, on the day the Lord returns, when he talks about the sea giving up the dead that I need, graves giving up the dead that I need, them, it's talking about the bodies of, in other words, the people who will have departed and gone to heaven. By the way, even the ones who will have gone to hell. Praise the Lord. They will be reunited with their bodies. 
and they will come to judgment. Oh, okay, there's a judgment of the just separate from the judgment of the what? In fact, in I think Revelation 20, where it talks about the great white throne judgment, we are looking at now the people who have resurrected a thousand years after the, the what? The righteous dead. And we are seeing them coming to the judgment, and they are coming from the sea, from the graves, from wherever they've been, but it's not that they have been in the sea. They have been in another place, but they... They are reunited with their bodies to come to judgment. Why? Because their bodies and them are actually one. Are you getting that? Now you're going to ask me, but some will have decayed, not some, all of them. They will have decayed, at, uh, atomized, deatomized, or whatever. That's none of my concern. But all I know is they will be reconstituted. To stand before, because we are not spirits who have souls, who live in bodies. We are spirits with soul entities and living in bodies that are also part of. So your body is actually a, a, your other self. Now, can I, can I prove that to you? <laughs> Glory, j j without scandalizing you. Glory to God. In, um, in, uh, You'll, that's why you'll start to notice that in the Bible, there is a, a fusion between, like in James 4, 8, when it says, it says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. And then it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Have you ever noticed those, that language? Purify your what? Who is to purify their hearts? The double-minded ones. I thought the problem is with their hearts. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's why in the Bible, there is, a, there is that switching of words. Sometimes you're wondering, is he talking about the heart or the mind? Like in Hebrews 4.12, he says that the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, cutting to the dividing of soul and spirit, bone and marrow. The word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the what? I thought thoughts are in the mind. Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, your mind is your heart's other self. And your heart is your mind's other self. That's why when you are broken hearted, even your mind is broken. Are you getting it? You get, you get what I mean. So, Mark eleven twenty three says, Whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his what? In his heart, but shall believe that those things which he has said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he has said. Shall not doubt where? Okay. Uh, it's good you said that. Now, in James 1, verse 5, the Bible says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives liberally and upbraids not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing doubting. King James says, nothing wavering. Uh, when you compare translations, that word wavering is the same word doubting. Hallelujah. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, tossed to and fro. And then he says, that man should not think that he will receive anything from what? From the Lord. Now look at verse 8. What does it say? A double-minded man. Is a what? So, shall not doubt in his heart means shall not be double-minded in his heart. Ah, okay, okay, okay. He shall not be double-minded. Now, a double-minded man is the same one that people come and say, uh, oh, he's the same one who says, I, I want to make this decision, but I have two hearts about it. Have you understood? When you have two hearts, you're being double-minded. Are you getting it? Hallelujah. Now, I, I, the, Lord is not, the Lord did not put these things there to confuse us. It is, it is actually plain when you understand it. Um, let's, let's look at, for example, 1 Thessalonians 5.14, which says, Comfort the feeble-minded. Comfort the what? 
comfort the what? Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all what? Men. Now, just, ch just look, change the translation there. Go to maybe NIV or what? Tell us what it says. Now there it says encourage the timid. I think New King James Version says, if you have NKJ, I think it's JV. It says what? Comfort the what? Comfort the what? The faint-hearted are the feeble-minded. <laughs> those who are not to doubt in their hearts are those who are not to be double-minded in their what? Because, you see, when the Bible says the word is sharp as to divide soul and spirit, in fact, it is amazing that that is the same scripture which then concludes by saying the word is a discerner of the thoughts of the heart. The heart is the spirit, isn't it? Romans 2, I think, 2.23 says that circumcision is not that which is outward in the cutting off of the flesh, but it's that which is inward in the spirit, that which is of the heart. <laughs> you see that? So the spirit is the heart, and then we're being told there are thoughts and intents of the heart. What am I saying? What I'm trying to say is that the reason this fusion is there is because God does ev God likes to do things in doubles or in du like duplicating things. That is why the way you look physically is the way you look spiritually. How do I know that? When the rich man was in hell, when the rich man was in hell, he saw Abraham, he knew this is Abraham. Okay, at least if you, if you doubt that he knew Abraham because Abraham had died long ago, at least he knew Lazarus. And he says, tell, please tell Lazarus to do, how did he know Lazarus? Because he had the same likeness. Praise the name of Jesus. <laughs> Glory to God. So, guess what I'm trying to say is this, this is an idea like of having another self. You see, everything the devil has, has, um, has, uh, has sort of brought into fame in these last days tends to be a perversion of something that is scriptural. Like in the, in the, in the entertainment world, there's a lot of talk about alter ego. The, the word alter ego just is a Latin word. It's a Latin phrase which means another self. Ego means self. That's why I tell people when you say, men have egos. Oh, men have egos. I'm thinking, how about women? You mean you have no self? <laughs> you see, an ego, to, to have an ego means to be self-aware. You understand? It means to be self-aware. Now, obviously... You should love yourself, but you shouldn't love yourself more than you love your neighbor. You understand? However, you should love yourself, isn't it? And you should be aware of yourself, and you shouldn't, um, what do you call it? You shouldn't make yourself diminish <laughs> or be nothing. You shouldn't be nothing for others to be something. You understand what I'm saying? But you should definitely want others to be something more than you want yourself to be something. You understand? Now, that's what ego is in, in the neutral sense. All of us have ego because you have a self-awareness. If I ask you what's your name, you tell me my, my name is John. You don't say, I'm not sure. I don't want to make others feel bad. There are others called Richard. There are others called Henry. You know, if I say John, the Johns will be so magnified. What are you talking about? That is ego. So, alter ego means another self. So now you hear people talking about multiple personality disorder. So somebody comes and this is just a trick of the devil. <laughs> so he's in court and they are, they are cross-examining him and then he manifests another self, an, an alter ego. And this one is talking like a woman. Oh, come. Let's go. Let's come and eat. Yeah. Who is that? What are you saying? Yeah. <laughs> now, you see, this generation has produced the most stupid intellectuals you can think about. The most, as in, people are so stupid, 
so stupid that multiple personality disorder is scientific and God is not. Eh? Can you imagine? They believe alter egos are just something from the subconscious self, the subconscious mind. What is that if it's not spiritual? You see, now, here is what I was getting at. That multiple personality means there are many selves in you, isn't it? And they even, they even have the audacity to say, now this one is called Carol. This one is called Angela. Now, who is that? Who is that? Angela. This is Angela. Then Angela first does her thing there for some time. Then, then Jemima comes and strangles Angela. They fight. And in this cosmic battle, guess what? The stupid psychologist is saying, now Angela must overcome Jemima so that she can be, she can be free. And I'm thinking, you guys, eh? you guys, you guys. Eh? <laughs> but now, what I'm trying to tell you is this is nothing original. God, who made us, spirit, soul, and body, made an identical body for an identical soul, for an identical what? Spirit. That's why in Revelation, there were the souls of those who had been martyred, who had been uh, martyred for the testimony of Jesus. You remember? And I think they were at the altar, and they were crying to God that when are we going to be avenged? But uh, I mean for, for having been unjustly killed, anyway, for the sake of the Lord. And then, you know, there is singing and all that business. But what I'm trying to tell you, the souls of men were not like some vapors that were in jars, you know, just oozing out like some cloudy, misty, uh, carbon dioxide, something. They were, they were real entities, persons, that you could say, this is Angela. The way Jemima is saying she's Jemima. You understand? And I wouldn't doubt that those so-called multiple personalities are demons. And haven't you heard of something they call familiar spirits? I remember I told you about neighboring realities. Now, what is a familiar spirit? A, a familiar spirit is, is a spirit that is familiar with you. It knows details about you. But that's not where it stops. A familiar spirit is also like you. It knows your voice signature. It has your face. It has your likeness. That is why someone can dream about you, a dream that is of God, and they see you in the dream and it's you. But they can also dream about someone that isn't you and something that is false, and it still looks like you. You doing everything that you would be expected to do, but in the service of a wrong purpose. And what's that? It is a familiar spirit. Praise the name of Jesus. That's why when people would go to these soothsayers in the Old Testament, the soothsayers would bring up the so-called departed, the ones who have died. So, just like what, like I said, there's nothing original now. So, the soothsayer brings a guy and says, like, and you've seen it in movies. Someone, you know, takes cards and tarot cards and whatever, and then they say, your aunt is saying she's not happy. You didn't pay the rent for the other, I don't know, grandmother or what. Some, and she probably has some detail about you that there's a lock of hair that she put in which drawer and what. And... It is like her. Hallelujah. It is another self. Now, there are other selves that ngatebiri yo, techiri yo, hallelujah. But that other self, ejitali yo, atejechiri, muzimu. You understand? You get what I mean? For example, we have virtual reality. Not, I don't know, holograms, computer-generated graphics and what. Those things are not real, Right? But those things take on a, you've had that expression, a life of their own. Hallelujah. Now, when something takes on, like Scooby-Doo is now really Scooby-Doo. There is something there called Scooby-Doo. Even you who doesn't believe in spirits, you will admit that Mickey Mouse is something. You can't say there's, there's no Mickey Mouse. 
There is no Mickey, there is no Peter Pan. There is no, I don't know what. Those things have taken on a self. <laughs> Hallelujah. On the screen, nonetheless, but they have become a self, even if there were no demons. That self is a self. <laughs> Hallelujah. The, it is a self that cannot be Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry is another self. There is a self called Peter Pan. There is a self called, <laughs> I don't know, Caspar, the friendly ghost. There is a self called, I don't know what. These selves actually have a life. And they began in the mind of somebody. And the person brought them to life. And now, like the Baganda say, if you indulge certain things too much, obsession, the problem is obsession, not, not I mean, watching Scooby-Doo once in a while is not the problem. But there are people who are obsessed. What happens? What do they say in Luganda? Hallelujah. The guy became Mickey Mouse. Hallelujah. We're talking about the meaning of life. Glory to God. The thing took on a life of its own, and then this life of its own, which was in, in virtual reality, metaverse world, came nechikwambala, nechifuka flesh, and what? <laughs> and blood. Now, in, the, in, in Ezekiel, the Bible says that God is going to take in the new birth, he's going to take out of us heart, stony hearts, the old stony heart, and he's going to put in us a heart of what? The heart is a spirit. In fact, he says, I'll put in you a new spirit, and I'll cause you to walk according to my statutes. He's taking out a heart. He's not, he's not talking about this heart which pumps blood. He's talking about a, a spiritual heart. The heart that he's taking out is going to be replaced by a spirit of flesh. <laughs> Are you seeing what I'm saying? That's what I'm trying to say that you, in James 2.26, the Bible says that as the body apart from the spirit is dead, even so, faith, if it has no works, is what? Just pause. You see, we read these scriptures over and over. What does that statement mean? It means that it is the spirit that makes your body alive. Right? So, if there is no spirit, <laughs> it is what? It is dead. So, that means your body is spiritual. Isn't it? Remember we said to know the life of something, we must know what it is to understand the life it, it, it is supposedly supposed to have. So we are being told that you take away the spirit from this body, what will you be left with? Dead. Nothing. Techiri <laughs> wo. Hallelujah. The body, therefore, and the spirit are actually one. These are not two different things. It's not a spirit living in a body. Because if the spirit left, the body would continue. Only against, hallelujah. No, when the spirit goes, the body also signs out. Because there is no one without the other. That's why I said, you then become a disembodied spirit, waiting to be returned to its host. Are you getting that? And that is life. That's one of the dimensions you must understand, that our bodies are spiritual. That's why when someone gets married, the Bible says they become one flesh. But have you ever thought about it? Are they glued together? Are they one chapati of flesh? <laughs> no. They are one flesh spiritually. Are you getting that? But the way they are spiritually one flesh is also physical because if something happens to your spouse... You feel it spiritually. Something has happened to her physically. You are remote somewhere, just like something happens to your child, and you're the mother, and you feel something. Glory to God. Because you, they, you call them your flesh and blood. But they are not glued on to you. They are not like, like what? Like tumors on you. They, they, are, they, are, they are what? Remote. But wherever they are, they are one flesh with you. But they're one flesh spiritually. I, are you getting what I'm saying? Basically, in all this conundrum I've given you, what I am saying is that your body is the other self of your soul, and your soul is the other self of your spirit. 
They are all identical, so much so that they are like that person who has multiple personality disorder. Except God, the creator, the all-wise, knows how other selves work together. His is not, it's not Jemima fighting with, with, with Angela or whoever. It's not that, although it is also in a way there, because the Bible says that the flesh warreth against the what? The spirit, so that you cannot do what you want to do. <laughs> so now when you're a multiple personality <laughs> case, <laughs> the flesh warreth against the spirit, but people thought that means get rid of the flesh. No, you get rid of it, you're going to be reunited with it <laughs> in the judgment. Hallelujah. So it is with you, Paka Last. Glory to God. The same way that your flesh is your other... You see, that is the same reason why, you see, we've said, he gives you a heart of what? He takes out the old stony heart. How, how is a spirit stony? Non-living things. <laughs> how is a spirit stony and how is a spirit flesh? I don't know any more than just to tell you that the same way that I can say there is hope for a tree, so there is hope for you. That when a tree is cut down, yet it shall do what? It shall live again. That's the same way that I can tell you he's going to give you a heart of flesh. Why? Because what is in one is in the other. They are, they are mirrors of each other. Hallelujah. That is why the Bible says that a broken heart wastes the bones. Have you ever read that? And a strong spirit is the life of the flesh. <laughs> In other words, when you are broken hearted, it's not just the heart that is broken. The bones are broken. The flesh is broken. It talks about how the, 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 the broken heart wastes the bones. The strong spirit is the life. The what? The life of the flesh. You want to have an alive body? Have an alive spirit. You want to have an alive soul? Have an alive what? <laughs> an alive body. It is, they are all together. And, and, and maybe the culmination of all that is when we talk about the five senses. We say the sense of what? The sense of, of, of hearing, sight, smell, touch, and what? And taste. And then the Bible tells you, it shows you all those dimensions are there in the spirit. Now, again, people have thought of it too much as now, even those who have sort of thought that it's possible. You see, that, like the Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is what? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That is taste. There is some kind of sensation that can be tasted. That is good. The Bible says, yeah, the word of God, the law of God, and the is it the being in the presence of God? It's tastier than the honeycomb. Yeah, it's much more to be desired than, than, um, than what? <laughs> than choice fruits and things like that. The spiritual thing has a taste. How about a smell? <laughs> the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3, I believe that, that we are the aroma of death to death to those who are dying. And to those who are to those who are perishing. Then to those who are being saved or who are being made alive, we are the aroma of life to what? To life. <laughs> Glory to God. That is smell. The Bible talks about hearing. Certainly there are things people hear in the spirit. The Bible says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying. So people have drawn from that to say, so there are spiritual ears. Which, is, which I believe is valid. But I've come to believe that a lot of this compartmentalization is because of our mind not understanding that duplicating. You, you remember what I said? That, you see, the prophets, some of the prophets used to say, and the Lord came and said to me in my ear. I believe that prophet, to him the word was as if another person came and, uh, and did what? spoke in your ear, except that the neighboring people didn't hear anything. So I've come to believe, now look at this, there's hearing, there's also seeing, obviously. Bible says, this is the doing of the Lord, and it is marvelous in our what? In our eyes. 
<laughs> Joseph talks about, about the, that the man cursed be the man that trusts in man and makes flesh his arm. Je- Jeremiah chapter 17 and says he shall be like a what? Let's read Jeremiah 17. He shall be like the heath in the desert. And then he says he shall not see good when it comes. There is looking and then there's also seeing. <laughs> He will look at good coming, but he will not see that this is good. Hallelujah. He shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the patched places in the wilderness, in the salt land, and not inhabit. This is the man who trusts in man and who makes the flesh his arm. So there is seeing, smelling, tasting, hearing, and what? And touching, the sense of touch. And the Bible says, talks about it again. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be a what? If a son to me he says, touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. For he is excellent in power and in might. Hallelujah. So there is touch even in the spirit. Jesus, Jesus felt when the woman with the issue of blood touched him in Mark chapter 5. Remember, there was a crowd, and then he turned around. And said, somebody touched me. And the, the, this guy said, Master, you, you see there's a multitude thronging you. And you are saying, somebody. Somebody. Hallelujah. Somebody touched me. And he says, yes, somebody touched me. I felt power going out of me. Neither was the power nor the touch physical. Yet again, it was physical. She touched him physically. And in physically touching him, touched him spiritually. While others were physically touching him, and they were not touching him. He wasn't touched. Like someone hears you, someone hears you, you someone and says, I was so touched by your message. It was very moving. <laughs> and then we think we are just being poetic. No, there's, there's literally being touched. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2.39, I believe it was. The Bible says, and they were cut to the heart. And they said, what must we do? And then he told them what to do. Glory to God. Cut to the heart, touched by the message. Somebody touched me. I felt power going out of me. Touching the Almighty. He's excellent in power. We cannot find him out. These are, I'm just trying to tell you, move from seeing these as equivalent to the natural sensations to seeing that, wait a minute. They are all one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You touch physically, your physical touch can have a spiritual touch. Just like a spiritual voice can enter into these physical ears and register some uh, somewhat, some impulses, or I don't know what, whatever they are called, stimuli, something like that. You, you, can, you can do what? You can, what did you talk about? Taste. You can eat something physical. Jeremiah was given a scroll. He was told to eat it, then he ate it, and at first I think it was sweet, then it became bitter, and then the Lord told him, now, this is how, I I don't know whether Israel is or blah, 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 whatever he was trying to tell him. The manna that they ate in the wilderness came from where? It came from heaven. The stomachs it went into were from where? The digestive system, the alimentary canal which digested this food, angel's food, was physical. It had no spiritual discernment of like, katizino protein, ziva muheve, nimwe temu zanya, temu genda zite kako hydraulic acid wa mwe, you know? Mwete bintu evi yogere ke kamwe, muve kumuzanyo. This is angel's food. Come on now. The food of the angels was eaten by physical men. Jeremiah was brought some food and was told eat. He slept. I think he ate some and slept. Then the angel woke him again and said, wake up, eat, because the journey is long. That food he was eating was spiritual food. But the, 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 the apparatus that was supposed to eat this food was what? Was physical. Hallelujah. That's why I'm trying to tell you, don't dichotomize, don't compartmentalize, don't separate. Now this is my physical self. This is my spiritual self. This is my church life. This is my work life. This is my, I don't know, relationship life. In my relationship life, I'm suffering. uh, Come on now. Glory to God. 
Just wake up and eat because the journey is long. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. I hope I've impressed you with that thought. Your body is your other self. It is you. Hallelujah. That is why you can't say, ah, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. If we need to get the spirit to work, we need the flesh to be what? That is why when you physically die, however strong your spirit is, the spirit has, has, has lost what? Has lost a host. It can't operate here. There is no network. Glory to God. It has to go back to sender. Reunification with the host. <laughs> Glory to God. So, at least I've given you an introduction. Next, next week, I intend to talk about the four kinds of life. Glory to God. I hope you've been blessed. Does someone have a, que a quick question? Then I'll, I'll be out of here. Maybe something that can't wait to next week. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for, for this word. We thank you for, for the message that has been spoken. May you impart these words into us, cause them to be alive, and cause us to be the, the, the more greatly blessed, the more greatly furnished, the more greatly enhanced in our walk with you. We desire to be one with you, to have your mind, to have your understanding, and we do desire to understand life, to know what is the meaning of life according to the word of God, and this we aspire to because you teach us so, and you desire that we may, we may have life and that more abundantly. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.